Todd McDonald and Andrew Prowse in conversation. There's a big entrance, look at that. Hello everyone, thank you for coming. Um, thanks Andrew for being here. Um, as Lynn said, Andrew's got a, a long history in, in the industry, in film and television uh, particularly. Uh, so tonight we're just going to have a chat, really. Uh, just some insights. Some of the students in the room have been working with Andrew and uh, some people know his work. So we want to keep it as informal as possible, so we brought the house lights up. So if there's anything burning that you want to ask during the course of it, we will have a sort of dedicated 15 minutes at the end for Q&A, but if you take umbrage to something or you want to challenge Andrew on something, just put your hand up and you can have a go. Right there, there's a mic, there's a mic over here. Perfect, thank you. Um, Oprah style, I'm gonna get into this. Uh, Andrew, so, uh, I, I'm an actor and I've, I worked initially, uh, kind of just missed you on a TV series called Rush, uh, over 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, so I've never directly worked with you, but... Um, well, I'm, you have, but you were just I was, the figure in the car. I was just sitting in the, the car. SMU. And what yeah. were you doing? Were you setting the camera up? I was, I think I was trying to get the actors to stop acting. Yeah. yeah. That's a good insight. You yeah, never got yeah. hold of me, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you've worked for about 30 years in the industry, give or take a decade here or there. Um, what's, tell, tell us a little bit about how, how you started out. Uh, maybe, you know, what were your first st steps? Um, my first steps were, I did a film course at, uh, Flinders University, which was the only university that off offered drama way back in mm. the 70s. It's that yeah. long ago. Um, and uh, I was also the only person who was brave enough to cut original film. So I became an editor because everything was, we shot on black and white negative film in those days or colour reversal. Somebody had to bite the bullet and say, we're going to cut it here. Uh, and that was me, mm. which was a particular kind of arrogance that yeah, right. Then it's did probably you, completely unjustified. And did you enjoy doing it? I did. I, I loved the idea of creating form out of chaos, mm. um, which is sometimes what an editor does. So there what are brilliant examples of editors like Jill Bilcock, for example, who yeah. is, in my view, almost entirely responsible for Baz Luhrmann's success. Mm -hmm. mm. So what le led you to directing then? Why didn't you stay an editor? I became frustrated by the kinds of directors I was working with. Right. And again, with a, a deal of arrogance, I thought, oh God, I can do that. <laughs> and then one day you find yourself in front of 150 crew people uh, and they're all expecting you to know what you're going to do. And you go, oh God, what have I done? Mm -hmm. But you bluff your way through it for a few weeks and then you start to learn. And yeah. most of my learning's been on the job. I, 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 got, I learned more in the first week of working than I did in two or three years of university. Yeah, I would say the same thing, especially mm. with film and TV. Mm. Actually sort of you learn very, very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And it happens very, very fast. You, yes, indeed. Even when you're shooting two minutes a day, it happens very, very fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's no time to muck around. And then one day you, you're confronted with shooting 18 minutes a day and you go, how do I do this? Yeah, yeah, that's good fun. But the other part of that was that being an editor means you look in, in enormous detail at what actors are doing. And you can see every, every little flicker of an eyelid, every, uh, it, you know, every lip movement, every head movement, every reaction to everything. And the thing that I could never understand was why do they stop? Why doesn't an actor just respond to what, what's happening. Why do I have to cut out the pauses? Mm. And that led me on this. It led me, first of all, to a hatred of actors. I thought, <laughs> what are these people doing? Why can't they just say what's on their minds? Why do they have to, why do they have to think about it? How much is the form to blame to, for that in terms of turning around the scene and shooting it the other way and, you know? It's to blame a lot, but there's a whole lot less excuse for it these days. Mm -hmm. Well, in those days, I mean, film used to be expensive. You know, it cost a lot of money to shoot on 35 mil. So you, you wouldn't shoot two cameras at the same time unless you had a huge budget. And, and, and a lot of, when we think about it, you know, the, the medium dictates a lot of how we go about it. Yeah. You know, what we can afford to do is, is critical. Um, so, yes, so actors, you very rarely saw in one shot an actor reacting 
to in real in a real way to what they were getting mm. because you'd never have the ability to cross shoot yeah now you do and lighting's changed you know digital cameras mean you can do all kinds of different things so you, you actually have the capacity to see both sides of a performance at the same time which means that actors can be probably subtler mm -hmm. you actually see the the reaction to the each reaction to each moment and you can capture it in a way you, you've never been able to before. Yeah, great. So uh, that working in that area into, into directing, did, did that then, was it the same uh, process that led you to writing because you were directing such terrible scripts and you thought, oh, I can do that, I can do better than that. I might have a go at writing. Well, you know, at, at the age of 25, you think you can do anything. Well, you can. That's it's true. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty much. You it can. Take, takes another 40 years to realise that. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. It you doesn't can't mean actually do, well. do everything. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, um, yeah. Um, one of the things that used to happen with pretty well every every Australian feature, and I cut a bunch of features back then, and miniseries and all that sort of thing, you'd throw away the first 15 or 20 minutes because the scripts were so filled with, they were filled with things which were exposition. And, and the writers would say, we need to establish something. And I'd go, why do you want to establish it? Why can't we just s tell the story? And people still do it to me. I, mm. I have a constant running gag with a writer called Justin Monjo. Uh, and he will say, uh, he's written something and he'll send it to me. I'll read it. And then he'll call me up and say, don't tell me. You want, to, you want me to drop the first 15 pages? <laughs> And I'll usually say, yep, <laughs> why can't we start in action? I mean, if characters are, characters are only what they do. Mm. They, they don't have any, any meaning apart from what they do. And you see them doing things and you understand the character mm. by what they do. Yep. So why do you need to establish that this person lives in a house here and does this and does that? Why can't we find out on the run? Yep. And so more and more, storytelling has become concise uh, if you look at if you look at tv shows from 30 40 years ago you would have an establishing shot of a house you would show the car pulling up because everybody wanted to know how the car got from a to b you don't do any of that anymore you just you just people are literate people are visually literate you can mm. and there's a fantastic story about the the uh, two guys who created the television series 24 the first series of that, these were guys, this was their last chance at a big TV show because they were in their 40s and they were way over the hill according to Hollywood in terms of writers. Anybody <coughs> over 35 is now unemployable. But so these guys are 45 and they've got this great idea and somebody likes it. And they've got the 24 hours plotted out. They're going to make this show and it's going to be wonderful. And away they go. They start plotting it. And in the space of the first four episodes, they've used up all their story gone. Mm. They have to then come up with another 20 hours of television, somehow. What happens? They, aren't they under like the sixth series of 24 now? Yeah, they These did These guys are well, in their 50s they? or 60s, aren't they? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> They're very rich too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so, but, but we tell story, there's so much story. There's mm. two or three times as much story in an episode of television now than there was 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so you worked in Australia, started off here, and then you did spend some time in the US. What's, I did. Tell us a little bit about your time over there, or what the what's the kind of what was the greatest difference between working over there and working here? Money. Mm -hmm. And and you you can kind of die of encouragement in LA, and you mostly do. Yeah, right. And there are people who make a fantastic living by uh, developing things. Yeah. There are, there are people there who've made a really good living for 20, 30 years and they've never had a show made or a feature made or anything like that. They just get things optioned. Do they become I, the kind I went, of in, I went down that path a bit because um, oh. yeah, a friend of mine and I wrote a very expensive and very huge miniseries. And we wrote an outline for it. It was a 30, 40 page outline. We took it off to NBC Universal and they said, we love it. And the, the best pictures are the ones that you get in the first line. So yeah. we had them in the first line. And, and we thought that was pretty cool. They paid us to develop it to a certain extent. Yeah. And uh, then the woman who, then something changed. Yeah, the woman who commissioned it, you know, died on a basketball court and it disappeared. So um, then we wrote a feature together and we sold that and that was good. And we were making quite a good living without actually doing anything. Actually getting yeah. anything up. Yeah, it's pretty, 
Yeah, pretty, yeah, yeah. Pretty nice. A little frustrating. It'd be nice to actually see some of these actually things have on the screen. Yeah. But the depth of the industry is enormous compared to Australia, obviously. It's, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. The amount but of like work Australia, it's about huge. who you know and who you can influence, and yeah, it's a it's and and there's enormous suspicion of outsiders. Why are there so many Australians apparently over there, and why are they so loved at the moment? Do you? Oh, uh, do you mean actors or technicians? A bit of both. I've got friends in the art well, department who've gone over there, who've really well respected, and obviously a lot of actors are over there. Well, Australian actors are over there because they're not Calvin Klein underwear models to start with. Right. And they're not. They're not. They're not. Okay. And, and that counts for quite a lot because th there was a phase there where every, particularly men, yeah. just looked kind of wimpy, yeah, right. didn't they? Yeah, yeah. You remember that period where yeah, they, were all, yeah. they all looked like they hadn't actually lived anything in their entire lives? <laughs> and by and large it was true, they were Calvin Klein underwear models. And if you've ever seen a show called, uh, what's it called, Friday Night Lights, mm -hmm. and if you know the character Riggins, who was an absolutely gorgeous looking guy. He was a Calvin Klein underwear model before he became an actor. Right on. So there was the, the sort of Russell Crowe phenomenon that you know, yeah. blokes were, were attractive. You yeah, know, they yeah, weren't yeah. necessarily the best looking people, but they had a kind of raw masculine energy, which yeah. American actors at the time didn't because they were just pretty faces. The Sam Worthington's of the world, that kind of... Yeah. 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 I remember and, Sam... And also they were very yeah. capable. They'd come out of um, shows like home and away and we're, we're able to yep. just walk onto a set and act yep. or not act as the case may be. All right, well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about, let's not, talk acting. about not acting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean by not acting? Why, uh, t tell, me, tell me about actors and what they should and shouldn't do. In your, what are your kind of, <laughs> these are the good things, these are the bad things. You just be straight up. Well, about it. well there's a, like with anything else, the conventions of, performance change, the, the, you know, the conventions of how we watch movies change, the conventions of what we believe change. Mm -hmm. And part of that is to do with uh, technology, so we're exposed to a whole lot of stuff. You know, back, back before television, you'd go and see a movie once, once a week if you were lucky. Mm. So you didn't have that kind of exposure to it. Now you've got 24-7 exposure to it if you want to, and our kids have all grown up. They understand film language in a way that we never did. Mm and hence the shorthand in storytelling. Acting, and the other part of that is that, that truthfulness in acting is, is, uh, is, is cultural. What you perceive as, as truthful is entirely dependent on what you've mm. you know, been brought up to believe. Yeah, so yeah. to begin with, anything that you saw on a screen was truthful because you hadn't seen anything else in the same way as the first time you showed people a image on, on a screen of a train coming towards you, they, they all ran away and ducked. Mm. It was real. Yeah. So what you believe and what you don't. So what's the difference between when, if you see, uh, if an actor comes on and works in front of you and, and you don't believe them or you don't, or you think they're acting or you think they're, it's, you're not positive about what they're doing, is it because you can see too much going on? Or are they um, working too hard? Yeah, in the, in, the, in the current sort of climate. Well, go back a few years and, you, mm. and you'd see these incredible constructed performances that, 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 you, that you still see, which are not, are not strictly speaking truthful, although, although a lot of soul searching has gone into them. Mm. But you still perceive them as being, they're very impressive and there are actors who still do it and get away with it. And, and a whole lot of you are going to hate me if I tell you that I think Meryl Streep is one of them. Her performances are incredibly constructed mm -hmm. and incredibly impressive, but I just don't believe them. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I'm watching Meryl Streep. I'm not, not sucked into it. Yeah, yeah. And the prime example of that is a film called The Iron Lady, if you've ever seen that. It's a brilliant impersonation of Margaret Thatcher, and I don't believe a frame of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm still impressed. I don't think there's any truth in it. Yeah. So what's the difference? Sorry. Like, who? Give me an example of someone you go. That was a great performance. Just as a by, by way of comparison, because the Meryl Streep lovers in the audience are just going, "Oh my God!" Nobody, so nobody God. actually jumped up and said, "I, I object to that." No, everyone just went, Everyone just clenched a bit. No, more. everybody oh. just went, "Oh, he's going to do. So he's going to say something terrible in a minute." <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, uh, an, an example I, I can think of just is: is has anybody seen Manchester by the Sea? 
Pacey Affleck's performance in that, I think, is... What do you think, Andrea? I haven't seen it. Ah! Oh. I, I just think it's extraordinary. There is not one thing that he does in that movie that he doesn't have to do. Mm. And, and that, for me, is the test of, of, of what an actor... Yeah, yeah, of, yeah. ..of good acting. The problem with good acting is you look at something and you go, I don't believe it. OK, that's easy to say. We're all critics. We can all look at... You, know, you go to the movie and say, I liked it or I didn't like it. Mm. What are you going to do to make it better? That's the question. Yeah. And that's the problem that all directors face and all creative people face, you know, how do you fix it? You know it's not working, how do you fix it? And Can you, and, and I mean, I guess that's experience on some level. On one level it's experience. On uh, another casting level, is another big, like the process of actually populating actually your work. Cast people who can do it yep. rather than people who can't. <laughs> Well, and then then, then you, solve a lot of problems. Then you yes. solve some problems when you get to them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, casting's huge in any, in any I mean, specifically in theatre where I work. Yeah. The majority of my time, if I can get the casting right, then then eighty percent of my work is done. Yeah, because then you know you have people a who a possibly have the capacity to do the work that you need them to do, um, but also are available to being pushed or pressured or yeah. and can expand. In, in the process of the making of the work? Well, if you're making films and TV, it's a very smart move to hire people who are better at what they do than you are. Yeah, that's a good life lesson. And it, it is. And the great thing about uh, movies and television is that they do all the work and I take all the credit, which <laughs> I think is a fabulous thing. So, so, <laughs> so then we get the sort of possessory credits and... Right, a know, film by Andrew A film Thomas. by, you know, or Written and directed, directed by... by and nobody knows that it was actually these other brilliant people who did all the work and all I did was go, yeah, I like that. No, mm. I don't like that. Okay. Who's the mo in, in today's industry then, in this, in this kind of uh, huge churnover of, of work that, that exists and, uh, and how we digest the enormous amount that we digest, who's the most influential person in a film and television or context? I mean, they're quite different. Let's say a television or a making of TV work. Ooh, that's a big is it an, is it the editor or is it the director? Oh, no, it's the collaboration. Yeah, um, I, I have an aversion to the, you know, what you can call the auteur theory that it's a, that a, an, a director is ever an author of a film. Any time I see a film by on a on a film, I, I remind myself that that's strictly a piece of marketing. You you flog a film by um, Michael Bay. Mm -hmm. And you know they're pieces of marketing anyway because they're heaps of spectacular rubbish. But, but that's a way of selling a film to an audience. It doesn't mean anything much. Yeah. And, but it has an origin in, in um, the uh, French New Wave uh, way back in the 50s and 60s mm. where, where they desperately wanted to create an art form, which American film wasn't at the time mm. until a man called Andrew Saris got on board with, with this French New Wave thing. Uh, and, and suddenly there were these auteurs who were discovered in, in American cinema, like Howard Hawks or Preston mm. Sturgis or, you know, and going way back to, what's his name, D.W. Griffith, who was the man who invented the sort of close-up and got berated by his producer who said, I paid for all the actor. <laughs> 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 so... If, if you do it properly, you, you realise that making films and TV is a, is a much bigger job than any one person mm. can reasonably control. Mm. And anyway, you shouldn't be controlling it. You should be creating a situation in which interesting things can happen. So do you find yourself working in a team then? If you're wanting to come up with a right. concept, do you have a set team that you stick with? Well, you, you tend to find people along the way who you have a... What do you call it? A rapport with? A rapport, or develop a language and with? Yeah, or, yeah. Or, or develop the lack of a language with so you don't have to talk very yeah. much about it. And, and that's happened to me a few times. Yeah, yeah. And it's a fabulous experience because it means you can concentrate on something else. And is that, so there's people on the set, is that you're talking about your DOP, you're talking about? DOP, editor. Yep. Yep, I have um, there are probably three or four DOPs I've really liked working with because they understand. You, you, you develop mm. a shorthand. Yeah. So all you have to do is talk about a, what you're trying to achieve and while you're blocking the scene and trying to figure it out with the actors, yeah, yeah. suddenly you find there's a camera over there and the DOP's gone, that looks cool. 
Does that happen with actors as well? Do you kind of develop a kind of relationship yeah, with do. certain actors and go, yeah, I want you to do. use that person again because yes, you do. I know they get what I'm doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a, you see it. You see it around. You also see it in live theatre. You see it in performance, of course, and people yep. complain and the young, young people coming in and you go, well, how the hell do I get into this? How do I break into this gig when Andrew only ever works with such and such? That's right. Well, actors are a different thing because there is always, there's a, it's always a lot of fun working with people who are coming into the mm. industry. You know, young actors, with the exception of you lot over there, <laughs> tend to be very open to trying different things, to being... And these you know, guys are not so open. Oh, they're all hopeless. Yeah. 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 I've got them next, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're... they're they are a fantastic bunch of people. And they, 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 it's been a, been a privilege and a pleasure working with them, except, uh, for, except for today. Today was hard. What was today? Today was auditioning. Today was, what do you call it? Self-testing. And, and it was pretty gruelling, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 What's, um, what is, well, I mean, you've got this group here, but there's also a group of other people. There's some film students, I think, in here as well. And well, they, were, they had to listen to me for two hours this morning. I won't ask you to go back over that again. What's, what's your... Uh, well, were they, they were directors and editors and whatnot? I think they were directing students, but most of them are not here, I think. Uh, two hours was enough? I think it probably was, Good. yeah. Uh, Fair enough. Well, you know, when, you, when you're being berated about what story is and you know yeah all that kind of stuff we had a chat the other night about that about what yeah i, I do you want me to talk about that now? well is no that i was curious about it because I, i'm curious about how all these things feed into a process for a, for a young actor to kind of come through and go what what are what are what is the important things like why do you why do you get up in the morning as an actor and bother doing anything and you know there, there is this kind of idea of ego and we just had a conversation about whether you're an artist or not an artist yeah we did and what is an artist? And do you so maybe maybe you should talk. You want to, me to do the artist? Talk to me a little bit about what you think an artist <laughs> should be. I don't. I don't think the idea of an artist serves you well. Uh, you know, we should talk about what, how you define artist, though, if you were to use that term. Well, in, in in my experience, artist is and and no, go back the other way. Mm -hmm. So, if you if you actually forget about art and think of craft and skills. Mm -hmm. I think that serves your creative purposes much better than thinking of yourself as an artist. Sure. And you know when this really hit home was when I was reading Michael Chekhov. You mm -hmm. read any of Michael Chekhov's yeah, yeah. stuff? And if you look at the elitist language all through Michael Chekhov, yeah. it's about elevating yourself out of the realm of ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And I hate that. Yeah, fair enough. Because I believe that Pretty well everybody in the entire universe is creative in one sense or another. It depends what you do with it. Mm -hmm. So the guy who manages to, who runs the, you know, the, the National Bank and who figures out a new way to rip you off is actually being very creative. Mm. Creative doesn't have any particular virtue mm. and it can be turned to horrible things as well. Yeah. We, we just happen to be engaged in these industries that are called for want of a better word, the arts, mm. and therefore we're artists. Mm, that's right. And so I don't think it helps to, to, to think that you're a, you are somehow a more sensitive or more informed or more intelligent or more anything person than mm. anybody else. And I think it's actually a cultural disease that goes back to... Uh, I know that it goes back to the 1920s, and, and there's a really interesting... We're going way off the track here, no, but, that's but right. it's kind of cool. We'll find a way back in. We'll find a way back. No, no, it goes back to one of my other fetishes, which is the the idea that you see what happened in British culture in the in the in the twentieth century, the early part of the twentieth century, is the creatives took they kind of took the whole, the high ground. Yeah. So people who were into science got denied. They were just technicians, and even though Einstein was there and the guys who discovered quantum mechanics and, and these really, really smart people with mm -hmm. ideas that have changed the world much more than anything that the literati did, mm -hmm. got ignored. So sometime in 1950 or thereabouts, C.P. Snow, who's a, um, a pretty interesting British intellectual, comes up with this idea that there's going to be, eventually going to be a, a merger of this where the... The, the literary people are going to disappear as the movers of culture 
and it's going to, and they're going to be supplanted by these these people who are big brain scientists who mm -hmm. are, who are thinking of much bigger implications than, yeah. and it's starting to happen. Yeah, so absolutely. So the people who are now extremely influential and coming up with much more interesting cultural ideas mm. tend to be science trained rather than arts trained. Yeah, and their notion and, of and creativity. Liter literature's kind of reached a dead end. Yeah. What what else can it do? You know, mm. you can only read so many novels and they all start sounding the same. And creativity, that's where, you know, there's a f there is an absolute obsession with creativity and Well, we're going to need a lot of creativity to actually survive as a species. Let me mm. tell you, we're, we're in trouble. We're, in my view, we're in big trouble. And that's a really dark, deep hole that I don't think we should We don't want to go down there. No, no. not quite no, there. No, no. Pull, pull it back But in. we could have a drink afterwards and yeah, get depressed. Yeah, we can go deeper into there. Uh, yeah. One thing you did mention to me the other night was about, the, which chimed in for me, was about relevancy. was about relevancy of story. I mean, why tell a story or what is... Not so much what is story, but why tell a story. Like, what's the, what's the key to... Well, that was your thing. Because yeah. you, you like these stories that are... That are, that are, you, you think they have a social value, and they, and they probably do. Oh, no, no, I don't think they have a social have value. I think they have, I think, I think there's a lack of pretension around them because they mean something to people now, yep. rather than trying to necessarily set something that's above people and they don't understand it, and they look up to it and go, well, I don't really understand that, but it's supposed to be important. I'm, I am quite fascinated at the moment of finding work that really connects with people. And, and I well, think as an actor, I, that, that always seemed to be a journey as well. I seem to attract, be attracted to work that I could find a connection with. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think that is important. And, yeah. And, and it's becoming... Well, there's another way. You can look at the negative side of that. Mm. And if you look at, for example, any American rom-com, it will... It will follow a certain kind of form mm -hmm. which will ultimately tell you that even though people have trouble finding each other eventually they will and they live happily ever after mm -hmm. what a heap of shit that is <laughs> as as a cultural concept mm. it, it doesn't happen mm. but does so why are they selling us this crap yeah and they're selling us this crap because it's like mcdonald's yeah. you're eating cultural mcdonald's it's like Ramsey Street. It's like Summer Bay. Sorry, I didn't mean your McDonald's. So I mean, no, no, other I'm McDonald's. MAC. That's yeah. right. The distant relatives. Yeah, at yeah. a farm instead of a yeah. fast food chain. <laughs> um, but that's that's. But isn't isn't Neighbours isn't Home and Away the same kind of formulaic? Why do people? Why do you think people want to see this stuff? Why are they addicted to it? Uh, for the same reasons they like drinking Coke. It's sweet. Mm. Is it bad for you? It's bad for you. Yeah. Yeah. What does it do to you? And it, and, and it doesn't it doesn't require you to do any thinking about this is a huge, what you this, ought to be. And it's the same in theatre. Like, you know, when we say, you know, I just want to go and see a, a musical. I don't want to have to think. I just want to be entertained. Just entertain me, Andrew. Just make something that's pretty on the screen, like a Michael Bay film with lots of kind of CGI and fights yeah. and effects. Yeah. I, I, I just find those less and less interesting. And if someone offered you a feature film to direct a show like that, what would you say? How much are you offering? Good, <laughs> Good answer. Because mm. uh, I think ultimately well, there's... Mate, if you're going to sell your soul, you, yeah. you want a good price for it, I think. Yeah. Do you have a... Do you actually want to... No, we won't. You offering we don't you? name a... What are you offering? I'll just take some notes here. <laughs> yes. I wish I had any money at all to offer you. But, uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, I think this, this is a huge uh, moral and kind of ethical mind field as a young performer to come yes. into the industry and go yes. how what do i do so i when i graduated uh from from training i just i, I opened myself and i'll just try anything i'll do anything i will try and do it. so i did a couple of tv ads a couple, i got it and then i got a gig on neighbors and i went down and worked on neighbors for two years which was the, that's where i learned the most mm. of of the three years i'd spent training four years i'd spent training um it was uh it was it was like just get on with it shut up just swallow your arrogance and say the words and hit the mark. Yep. And I was get, I got obsessed by trying to sort of, you know, how much prep and work I needed to do. And as soon as I let that stuff go and could actually just sort of listen to the other actor and actually just understand the intent of what I was trying to do, then it, it actually kind of cleared up and became... Yeah. Not so much that it became easier, because there's a huge skill in me able to do it well, I think. Yes, there is. Uh, and I have a huge respect for... The Jackie Woodburns and the Alan, you know, the, the people have been on that show for 20 years because I look at Jackie's work and go, well, she's still in 
pretty much every moment I'm seeing there, I haven't watched it for a while, but it's quite remarkable the quality that she can still bring day in, day out, nine to five, 40 weeks a year, you know, for 20 years. Mm. I think it's a huge, and it's craft. I kind of look at that and go, well, that's, that's, that's being a craftsperson. Yeah. You'd have a hard time calling neighbours out, wouldn't you? Mm. Uh, yes, you, you would have a hard time calling yeah. it out. Well, I don't think it serves that purpose. I mean, it depends on what you think the purpose of um, art house films are. Well, the purpose of Neighbours and, and Home and Away is to sell advertising space, basically. Mm -hmm. The purpose of television is to That's the purpose of sell TV. advertising space. So you can be very cynical and say, if you're making TV, you're just you know, kind of trying to do things that lift the price of the advertising. Yeah, yeah. Which is a terrible way to go about thinking of, you know, that you're an artist. I mean, that, that, that kills you, doesn't it? Too hard. Too hard to be an artist Very and Very hard to be an work. artist, yeah. So On the other hand, you can go and um, make really interesting little movies on your iPhone. Yep. And nobody will see them, but you maintain an enormous amount of integrity. Yeah. So you've got, so you've got a little real dilemma to work with here. But so, uh, as, as, a, as a young person yeah. coming out, you, you really don't want to think a lot about integrity until the point where you can afford it. Mm. So you want to make a lot of money very quickly and, and preferably go to LA and you know, get on a show and make a couple of million dollars a year. Right. And then, you, then you'll suddenly places. find that you have an enormous amount of integrity. No, I don't want to do that. That's not for me. Can somebody offer me something that's mm. got some more integrity? Mm -hmm. And that suits my... In the mean, back in the real world. Back in the real, this is the real world. In the meantime, when you're not, when for the 99% uh, of us who aren't going to uh, shoot yeah. off to Hollywood yeah. uh, and make a living pitching or actually getting on that series or that film, uh, what are the kind of day to day, what's the survival tips? How do you sort of stay, what, why do you get out of bed in the morning? Well, you get out of bed in the morning because you have to make a living mm -hmm. and, and you find. The thing, the thing you find is that even on something that is as mundane as Neighbours or Home and Away, mm. if, if you're going to... I mean, I'd never, I'd never even watched Home and Away until was it last year when, when somebody said, do you want to do some Home and Away? And I thought, that'd be kind of cool to go and see how they do it. Because mm -hmm. it's a machine. It's a, it's a juggernaut. It's astounding how much they get through and how organised it is and how close it is constantly to the point of collapse. Mm. It doesn't take much and the whole thing would fall in a screaming heap. Mm -hmm. But um, um, what you find is that it doesn't matter what sort of drama you're talking about, there are, there are things that it has in, com in common. There are it, human stories are the same, whatever mm. budget you're dealing with. And the you know, neighbours and home and away, you keep repeating the same thing every three months, do you think? Yep, about that. Perhaps. Three to six months. Yeah, same over, over 6,000 episodes. Yeah. They've probably repeated the same storyline a hundred times. Yeah, at least. And pretty much the scenes are interchangeable. But what you find yourself doing is finding the thing that can inspire you in it. And that's what you, you, you live mm. for. And at some point you will go, like I did, I think I've, because I've, I've, I've directed, you know, a hundred and something hours of TV, which, yep. is, which is, you know, takes you quite a while. Yeah, yeah. And, and at some point you go, why am I doing the same thing every single time? Why am I, why am I getting up in the morning? Mm -hmm. you know, they, I've done it. What am I learning from it? And then you go, I don't want to do this anymore. And then you realise that that's all you can do. And you better <laughs> find a way of making it new and interesting for yourself or you're going to be starving for the rest of your life. It's and a good and picture you, for you guys out there. And you can find it. You can find it. <laughs> yeah. You've just got to look at each thing as a, a specific example. And they're all, they're all ultimately different, as we are all ultimately different people. Look, I, I think... Our experiences are the absolutely. same. Absolutely. I think everyone goes through phases of being completely discouraged by what they're but, doing. Yes. But needing to just keep going. You just sort of don't have a sense of why you're doing it. You just have to keep going. And I, I certainly reached a point where I don't know what else I can do. All I can do is this. Well, that's I, terrifying, I isn't it? I know. Right. Then, you, know. you know, I can't go and be a lawyer now. I'm too right. old. I do have a friend who retrained as a doctor at 38, which I was in yeah, I had complete a brother. awe of. I had a brother who was a punk musician who decided he was going to be a lawyer at about the same age. Yeah. It's, you know, but there's well, also a drive there. Certainly as a performer, there's a drive there 
there is a there is a performative drive where I, I don't think I will give up, ever give up actually performing. I, I don't moment. think I can. I don't think I can ever retire, mm. which I I think is a good thing. I, I'm not the least bit interested in cruises on the Rhine. I don't, back I don't, and I don't know why. Novels, watching films. Not, not watching films. I don't <laughs> watch films. I want to make films. I want to do things. Yeah, yeah. And, and that that is a. It becomes a reason why. That's the reason why you get up in the morning is because it still inspires you. Yeah. In some way. And are you uh, are you seeing in this in this sort of age of the huge amounts of TV that's being made? Are you getting inspired by some work that you're seeing? Oh yeah. I mean, in, in the time that I've been involved in it, TV has gone from being basic pap to being the, the place where the best writing, best performance, the best performance, yeah. the best direction is, the best stories are. Yeah. And that's fabulous. Yeah. And film has gone from being the place where interesting ideas were happening to, to recycling and, yeah, yeah. and you know, tempo movies that we're... All, people, all the people who are making them care about is the first weekend's box office. Yeah. And they're crap. Yeah, it's flipped around. It's more it accessible. It's totally flipped. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got a few more minutes before we do some questions. What do you think... So in, in, in Australia, uh, what, do you, what do you think about in terms of the, the... What's the best thing about the industry here? In Australia, in, as as a, we, and a is it, this advice? Maybe this is advice to young people coming out into the industry. What would well, you say to them? Well, the best thing about the Australian industry is, is we didn't ever get to finish talking about what why you get the up. American industry oh yeah likes them, and that is because Australians do brilliant things with string and rubber bands. Right, uh, and and a lot of the reason why there was a period there where Australian DOPs were huge in the US, people like, um, what's his name, John Seal, and people yeah. like that, Yeah, yeah. Don McAlpin. They were in demand because they could do things with fewer lights and fewer resources and make things look really good. And they had to do that because Australian movies were right. cheap. Yeah, so, so they had ingenuity so they in and creativity. Yeah, and when you think about what we do, like, you know, we, we, we shoot an episode of, of a TV series, a serious one, mm. in six or seven days. The Americans take, and we do 10 hour days. Yeah. So you've got a 60 or 70 hour working you know, a, a, a amount that goes into that. Mm -hmm. The Americans will take eight or 10 days and they shoot 12 hours a day. Yep. So there's a lot, they, they're very inefficient. And it's for the same reason, I remember going flying to LA once and sitting alongside an engineer who was in huge demand. I said, what is it? And he's about, about Australian engineers because he told me they were hugely in demand and it's the same thing. They could do things, they could think for themselves and think of ways around problems whereas yeah. the Americans were thinking, oh, this is how you do it and money was no object. Yep. And that's, that's one reason. Yeah. The other reason for why, why actors are in demand apart from the Calvin Klein underwear factor yep. is okay. because they do things like home and away. So yeah. pretty much, where did I read this today? I was in the article that Mark sent me about, about Home and Away, that if you've done two years on Home and Away, you'll get an audition in the US because they know that you can learn lines, hit marks, right. do all that sort of stuff. You've, you've got a, a basic training. I didn't know that. Sam, can you send me that, Mark? Yeah. Two years on you, you'll just have to go back. I'll be all right. I'll be good then. Good to go. Thank yeah. you for that. That's great. I think, I think the idea of being pragmatic and practical... Well, we are. Industry, We're very... When, on the positive side, we're very pragmatic people. What's the what's your biggest problem with the industry in Australia? It's crap. <laughs> Too general. Can you hone that down a little bit for me? It's, it's really, it's really, really crap. Outrageous crap. <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem with the problem with television is that it's deeply, deeply conservative, particularly yep. free-to-air television, which hasn't reacted very well to to the inroads from, mm. from streaming services and American TV. Sure. And, and it, it's trying, what it's doing is trying to shore up the audience that it already has. Yep. So who, who pays the bills with TV? It's, it's Coles, Woolies, Bunnings, the banks. Yep. Sure. They're, they're basically the, the revenue stream. And what free-to-air TV does when it contracts is it says, okay, what are the people in the western suburbs of particularly Sydney, 
mm. or the, but then secondarily the equivalent in every other city, but it's really the western suburbs of Sydney. Mm -hmm. They're the people you're trying to get to buy crap. Yeah. What, are, what do we feed them so they keep watching? So that's, that's television. The ABC has a different problem, mm -hmm. which is that it doesn't know sometimes why it's doing the things it's doing. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's, it, it does things on, on the one hand that are pretentious and literary and mm -hmm. sometimes work really well. So The Slap, for example, which I'm not a fan of, but I accept that several of you here probably are. And then things like Seven Types of Ambiguity. That's, that's the literary stuff that, that is you know, culturally significant yep. and important and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. On the other hand, it does stuff which is complete rubbish and I don't know why they do it. A lot of, a lot of ABC comedy is just dreadful. Yeah, sure. It doesn't seem to have a you know, purpose or a point. Yeah. And a lot of it, a lot of it um, what they think are innovative are, are in fact often confused. You know, shows like, uh, what was it called? The Code. Oh, yeah. Which was, you know, a brave attempt, but ultimately kind of off-putting. And the audience just went, ugh. And the ABC has a problem anyway, and that is that its average age is older than me. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely true. And and nobody to... under 50 watches the ABC. I watch the ABC every now and again. Yeah, but you're a, you know... A literati. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Wank. You're, you're an honorary 60-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I don't, yeah, that's, um, thank you. There's a, so much that kind of makes up a career. There's so many stories that make up kind of who you are. So it's a, such a short amount of time to spend with someone who's had this many years in it. But if, is there, are there any questions that people want to ask or were, um, anybody want to know the secret? Oh, Andrea Moore, here we are. Here comes, here comes the trick question. Oh, there we go. There's. So, Andrew, you've been here teaching the actors at QT. <clears throat> what, are the, um, what are the main things that we should be teaching young actors? Just a list. What are the, what are the main, most important things that you think um, young, act young actors should learn in a, in a teaching environment? Um, they, they need to learn how to be truthful. That's the first thing and, and, and pretty much the only thing. If you, if you could teach them nothing else but how to, how to pay attention, listen, make it about the other person, you know, all those things, then everything else they can learn. And, and that knowledge would enable them to fit all of the other obstacles into a, a framework that they could understand. So. If you, if you manage to get that to happen in first year, then all of the things like what is film, hitting marks, you know, kind of focus issues, what does a film crew do? If you can hang on, if you can get them to a place where they can hang on to mm. that, that's, a, that's, that's never going to go away. Do you think there's that's another, a... There's another way in, in which you can become completely confused. And I mean, I remember seeing lots of actors who came out of your alma mater, NIDA, who it took five years to figure out what they were doing because mm. they, they were completely confused about what their role was. And, you know, am I a theatre actor? What is the difference between film and theatre and yeah. all that kind of stuff? And so, you know, it's that really basic thing of what's the job of an actor? The job of an actor is to speak the words truthfully. What does that mean? It's not the job of an actor to tell a story. That's the job of the, of the text. The text will tell you the story, whether it's got actors or not. You can read it and you can find out the story. Mm -hmm. So it's not the job of a director to tell the story either. Yeah. The job of the, the job director is to get the actors to talk faster. Yeah, right. <laughs> Who's, who tells the story then? The script's already done that. The writer. The writer. And the writer what does the editor the do? The editor... Tells it better. Makes it better. Well, in, in, the editor takes you on the guided tour through the, through the story. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was... a when I was an editor and I thought editing was everything, I used to say directors make shots, editors make movies. Right. Once I became a director, I thought that was that's crap. <laughs> 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 um, so, telling the truth and being authentic, or yeah, or being present, authentic, truthful, whatever you want to call it. Is it about getting rid of stuff 
And so that you're you're it's, just being yourself, or it's is it getting rid of the? Uh, yes, it's it's about getting rid of a lot of stuff and making it simpler. Yep. Make, making the the business of acting as simple as you can possibly make it. You can basically people can do one thing at a time. Right. And if you ask an actor to be charming and and a bit pissed off at the same time, you're going to be watching a dog's breakfast. Right. Good. Actually, you shouldn't ask them to do those kind of things anyway. Yeah. It's it's wrong like kind of directions. Bad acting. directing. Bad directing. Yeah. Um, uh, so, is, and what about acting technique? What's the use of it? Where is it useful to have technique or be trained as an actor? When you're doing something that you don't understand intuitively, mm -hmm. particularly. Which, you know, which is, is which is quite a lot of the time. Those things will happen. So you can do simple things that you can relate to very easily, but there will be things that you're required to do where mm. that require some understanding of a cultural context, mm -hmm. uh, of a particularly weird, you know, relationship dynamic that you yep. have no experience of. Yep. How do you do that? And that has to do with the kind of uh, emotional preparation that actors need, do need to do. I mean, you can do things that are very simple, mm -hmm. but they won't have the depth without the, the, the kind of emotional preparation. You told me uh, a couple of nights ago, just waiting for other questions, that, okay, one, minute, one second, and then uh, just about the, the idea of how much preparation is too much, or the concept of interesting choices as an actor. Can you maybe speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Particularly about the preparation side. So, uh, what, what's well, you need, you need to do enough preparation so that you feel capable of approaching it. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to fill in an entire backstory or a, you know, or a, um, you know, it, it's, you need to fill in the things that the script demands that you know. In the scene that you're doing. Yeah, in, yep. only in that scene. And the accumulation of those scenes might mean that you, you actually do develop some kind of backstory. But you don't want bits in the backstory that are going to intrude on the, on mm. the actual story. The, the, the clues for it all should be in the text. Mm -hmm. So you're not making stuff up. You're, you're extrapolating, but you're extrapolating on what's already there, yeah. rather than having to come up with it. I mean, you, you've any actor has read those terrible scene break. Uh, sorry, character breakdowns they give you uh, with the one one or two liners. No, no, the, 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 the two pages. Extensive two pages. And yeah, you suddenly right. find that you know at the age of three, so and so uh -huh. had a nasty experience with dog. Uh, yeah. And, and you go, well, how do I play that? Yeah, I need a dog in this scene so I can show you how to play him the dog. If, if there's a dog, what am I going to do? Go, ah! It's not be able to speak the lines. <laughs> yeah. It yeah, doesn't yeah. help the story, does it? Yeah. So um, only the things that are, that are kind of useful. And, yeah. and you figure out what they are eventually. Mm -hmm. And you need, you need, you need a, the kind of courage to carry it out. That's, that's the other important thing. I mean, you know, acting is a bit like, you know, diving off the... 10 meter platform. Is there a, is there you a... You can't change your mind halfway down. True. Yeah. Without belly flopping. Or breaking your legs. Or breaking your neck, yeah. 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 Depends if you hit feet first. Who, there was another question. Andrew, um, as a writer, how precious are you about the, the actor following, is saying every single word? In y years gone by, I've had script writers scream at me because I have changed one or two things oh, with with the the directors um okay but um how do you do you feel very precious about your writing oh as a as a writer lynn i'm incredibly precious about my writing but but as a director other oh. people's writing is i mean they, they're just confused and i'm just trying to help them out no um <laughs> it, it it's it, a lot of what you deal with in television is, you know, because of the constraints of it, you know, the, you, you're working with, you know, drafts that are not complete, um, that haven't been thought through, and, you know, every every TV show I've ever been involved in has, has had major rewrites. And that that has structurally something to do with the way that we make television in this country, which I think works against good TV. And in terms of script development? It's the way we do it. What All you have to do as a writer is make sure you don't get fired after the, before the second draft. Right. So you don't, you never carry it through. You, so you, you never actually take, no writers 
very rarely do they take responsibility for their writing all the way through because you know that what usually happens is you write the first draft and then they change the plot. Okay, so, the, so you've got over. a new first draft now. Hmm. So, so I've now written a new first draft and I've got paid for drafts one and two. You know what's going to happen is that the uh, script editor, who just happens to be a, a recently promoted person from the production office, <laughs> is going to rewrite the bloody thing. So why do I care? So you've got a, a, a don't care attitude. And you also know that the, the director's going to come in and have a meeting and go, well, that doesn't make any sense. And, and you know, it, it's, it's, you're in that position. It used to be much more common that, that producers and directors insisted that every word was spoken, and that's where your experience would have, would have come from. Mm. Because, um, and not necessarily because writers were precious, it was be but more because they didn't trust the people who were changing the stuff. Like the directors were functionaries. And often the, the, the if, if, a, if you found a director who had the trust of the producers, you know, you, can, you could change whatever you like. I remember I had a fantastic experience with a producer called Sandra Levy, who, who you know, she was head of the ABC for a while and a whole lot of other things. And we had some terrible scripts on a show called Big Sky. And uh, one day, we just started throwing heaps of it away because it was rubbish and kind of sort of half writing and half making up other stuff that made a whole lot more sense. And, you know, I, was, I wasn't just doing this. I was, I was doing it in collaboration with the cast and all that sort of stuff. And Sandra w was insisting that she used to watch the dailies or rushes, as we call them. They call different things in different countries, but um, and I'd call her up every day and say, "Have you been, have you been watching the Russians?" And she'd say, "Yeah, it's really good." Yeah. Call her up the next day. Yeah, it's really good. After the fourth day, I called her up and she said, "I have just watched the Russians with the script in front of me," <laughs> and she hit the roof. Uh, but she did agree that what we were doing was better. It was just the principle of the thing. Mm. Mm. So there is a lot of, in some places, it's a, there's, there's huge latitude to make things better. In other places, it's, and, and my writing, no, I'm, I don't claim to be a, a, a brilliant writer. There are always better ideas. You know, and somebody, you, know, you, you always, there are clumsinesses, and, and sometimes the clumsinesses are only apparent when, a, when an actor says them. You know, the, you go, why did, why did I say, why did I add that extra sentence, mm. that extra phrase? I, I could have said less. It's usually taking things away because writers often tend to overwrite. They over-describe, they overwrite, and seeing people do things is a much more efficient way of figuring out what, what you need and what you don't. Mm. Other questions? Yes, down here. Um, so... It became sort of apparent to us, I think everyone would agree, when we got to work with you briefly, that you had a really great um, ability to communicate to actors on set. And it's obviously very apparent that you have a lot to teach actors. But where exactly did you start, kind of develop those skills with having had a lot more to do with directing and editing than acting? Well, if, you, if you're a director, you have a lot to do with actors. You're, you're working with them. And it's the same thing, you, you know, do I believe it, do I not believe it? And if you take your job seriously, you have to know, you, you really want to know, what do I have to say to actors to, um, you know, to, to help them? Because you, you're trying to help them, you want them to do, you want them to do things perfectly so you don't have to say anything, because then your job's easy. Hmm. So the, you, it's not just about fault correction either. It's, it, it's about um, how we're telling the story, what are, what's at stake, and it's all those kind of things. And, and if you flounder and you're serious about your job, you realise really quickly that, that you have to know. And my opportunity came when I was doing a show called Heartbreak High and we had, um, we had a, a, a dramaturg who Andrea knows pretty well, who was obsessive about um, about acting technique and, and what you needed to know as a director. And we spent, we used to have, rather than a you know, camera department, grip department, electrics, we had a, an acting department. 
and these were all young actors and any time they went on set they were in the acting department doing exercises, uh, you know, looking at scenes, working out meaning, working out objectives, actions for the next bit and, and improving their craft. And in that context I couldn't help but learn a great deal about acting. And, and did you put yourself into those, yeah. into that scenario as well with them? So you oh, absolutely. Listen yeah. to the language. Yeah, whenever yeah. I wasn't doing anything, I was in there too. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. and learning heaps. Mm. So that's pretty much where I got interested. And, I, and then I used it in my work after I went on to do other things because I found it useful. And I found that even actors without any training in practical aesthetics or Meisner or any of those kind of techniques would respond to what do you want and how are you going to go how are you going to get it mm. and and those two things make sense they make sense to actors in any context yep. and if you have you know a clear objective you can actually do something which is what acting is it's doing to act is to do you know it's all that sort of stuff if you want the, you know, the slogans that go with acting technique. There's one, one more question over here. Did everyone hear that question? Uh, the question was about the relationship between the director and the DOP a little bit more, and uh, what your what your experience with it is. Oh yeah, have you ever been a DOP? Um, I, when I was at university, I had a crack at it. How'd you go? Badly. Editor. Much more of an editor. Became an editor. Yeah. Right. So, what is your relationship with the DOP? What does it what does it mean? Um, well, you, you're trying you're trying to work out what is the most effective way of telling a story. So, okay, you're you're a director and you you know what the story is. The story is somebody wants something, but okay, you hang on to that. That's that's the test of every every single thing that you do. So, what is the best visual way to tell this story? Should we do we need to shoot it handheld with wobble cam? Maybe we do. That would make it you know, incredibly dynamic. You have these discussions. Or should we shoot it really formally in tableaus and let everything happen in front of the camera like you're looking at a proscenium? Mm. Okay, well, there, are, there are legitimate reasons for choosing any of those things, depending on what the material is. So, for example, but you can also figure it out. So when we made a show called Rush, I don't, which was back in 2008 or something, was, was the first thing, it was a police show. Not the old ABC one, for those people who are old enough to remember it, with John Waters. Not that one. No, you want the one with Roger Corser and Cal Mulvey and Catherine McClements. We, I'd just seen the uh, Paul Greengrass's Bourne movies, you know, with all that sort of really dynamic camera work, and it felt like the, uh, felt like the camera didn't quite know what was going to happen. So stuff was happening, and there were cameras there, and it was like it was, you're looking at it, it was... It's like news camera coverage of drama. And I thought, why can't we make a TV show like that? And, you know, particularly a police show where you don't know what's going to happen. So that's what we did. And the discussion with the, the DOP was, was, you know, he, he contributed, this guy called Bruce Young, who's, one of, who's a terrific DOP. He contributed a lot to it. So I sort of planted an idea and he'd come back with an idea and then we'd go, well, how are we going to do this? And eventually we came up with this idea of using news gathering cameras. Who gets because the final they, say? They sit on your shoulder. Does he? Well, no. As the director, you well, go... I do. Yeah, right. Yeah. Until the producer says, what do you Actually, think you're doing? it's my decision. Which, which we... Which we <laughs> I remember once we shot on Heartbreak High, we started, we started shooting in Dutch angles for some reason. You know what Dutch angle is? It's almost like, you know, like that. And once we started shooting, it was really hard to stop. And, and so we shot a whole day like this, and I called up the producer, who's Ben Gannon, who was just the loveliest man on earth. And I said, you know, he, was, he was away. That's you right. just started doing this? Yeah. Right. Because yeah, it, it looked really cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I, I called up Ben at the end of the day and said, uh, Ben, um, how do you feel about Dutch angles? And he said, <laughs> he said, they're fine as long as you don't use too many of them. So we just shot the whole day. You're right. And we Rish. thought, okay, what do we do now? Do we stop? Because it'll make the rest of the stuff look weird. <laughs> so we kept shooting Dutch angles. So just one episode was just, like just was Dutch just, angles. Just the whole thing was like that. Yeah. yeah. That's great. That's a, good, like that. that's a good one to Then you on. had fascinating debates with the DOP about which, which Dutch were you were oh. using. 
what, what's the effect of, you know, if somebody looking down or you do it that way, they're looking up. What does that mean? Does that, is it powerful to look down? Is it powerful to look up? What do you like? Do you like an assertive DOP who will say, we need to be, we need to, to this needs to be more striking in this, this the, the writing is no. requiring us to tell the story like well, this. Well, no, I like a, a, um, a DOP who, who actually reads the script yep. and who wants to tell the story. Because there are a lot of DOPs who want to make pretty pictures and that's right. called camera worship and it's a disease of the film industry. So there are a lot of Australian films with a lot of crap stories and pretty pictures. Mm -hmm. And you've probably seen some of them. And they're a reason why I don't go to Australian movies very often and I feel bad about that. Unless they're yours. But, mm? Unless they're yours. Unless, well, I don't go to those either. No, no. of course you don't. But I, I, I tend to <laughs> not, you know, I've done something, I've finished yeah. with that and I don't go back and look at it. And I got a hell of a surprise one night when I was watching late night TV and I saw something and I went, oh, that looks cool. And it took about 10 minutes before I realised there was something I'd directed. There you go. I'd forgotten it. That's Good terrible. Work. Any other questions? That, did that sort of answer your question? Yeah. Sort of. But you do need to engage in a, in a dialogue about how you're going to shoot things. So, you know, for example, uh, um, when uh, I, I directed the first episode, Dr. Blake, which I'm not very proud of, but I, I don't think... Well, Dr. Blake was OK when we started and then it got worse. But we had a discussion about how do you shoot a, f how do you shoot a period show in an environment where there are a whole lot of things that you can't, you can't see, in short of you know, a lot of CGI or a lot of drapes to mm -hmm. hide things. So the only way you can really do is to shoot at very long lens so that you know, a lot of backgrounds are out of focus. And so that, that kind of discussion will happen with a, with a DOP. You, sometimes you're solving production problems, sometimes you're solving visual problems. Mm -hmm. But the best DAPs, you don't have to talk to very much at all because they get what you're trying to do and they're coming up with ideas all the time about what if, what if, what if, what if. And uh, there are you know, three or four who, are, who I've managed to develop shorthand ways of communicating with. So you save all the long conversations for the people who don't get what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. The people who do, you don't have to talk to very much. So you look for that. That's a really good thing. I think that's all time we have. I don't want to drag us on too long. We've already gone over a little bit. But um, I'd like to thank Andrew. Thank you very much for sharing the conversation with us and uh, the, the foundation for having this, having this conversation tonight. I think we're going to go down the bar I, and have a while. I just want to say thank you to the Lynn, to the, to the Lynn Foundation. The Lynn. The, Ray, the, the Rainbow Reed. Reed Foundation for actually bringing me here because it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, well done. And thank you all very much for taking some time out to come in and, and have a chat with us. Thank you. Thank you.